It's 11, let's continue. So the second talk is given by Javier Quacharua. And so it's about you no know, distributed quantum advantage for approximate graph covering. Oh, please. So hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be here to present you this result, which was the outcome of a rather large collaboration. So I first want to thank all of my co-authors, Francesco Damori, Rishikesh Gayala, Fabian Kuhn, François Legal, Enric Livonen, Augusto Modanese, Marc-Olivier Renou, Gustav Schmidt, and Yuka Swomel. So the, the conclusion of this work will be that the speed of light bounds the speed of quantum distributed computing. And the model that I will present is mainly a model of quantum communication. So now it might seem obvious at first sight that the speed of light will bound the speed of quantum communication. However, the conclusion of the last decades of research in quantum information tells us that this is not so obvious. One example is that non-locality, quantum non-locality can in some special case replace communication. Maybe the best example of this is pseudo-telepathy, so a form of Bell inequality, for example, the magic square game, that can be won um, without any communication. There are also results that generalize what we can do with quantum non-locality. Um, and but so they generalize quantum information, but still imposing causality. And we have results like, for example, the one by uh, Van Damme that says that um, for bipartite and distributed computing, the complexity collapse in presence of super strong non-locality. So for this reason, it's, it's not trivial to, to, to find bounds on what um, imposed by causality in networks. Um, and today I'm going to present you some no-go results. And they will be obtained by combining two lines, um, two directions of research. On one side, we will have no signaling bounds that comes from causality or the speed of light that will impose constraint on what networks of quantum computers can do. On the other hand, we will have fast classical algorithms. And this will create a sandwich. And by bringing these two lines of work close together, we'll be able to rule out quantum advantage. So today we'll focus on the part that is the no signaling bound and on the model. Um, but there's a lot of our work that is also about this classical algorithm. And for this, I refer you to um, the paper, especially if you're interested in graph theory, there's some cool techniques. So what's graph coloring? Graph coloring is this very natural problem in computer science where you have um, a graph here, it's gonna be a graph of computers and they want to output some colors such that computers that are neighbors have different colors. So more precisely, we can look at, for example, C coloring of key chromatic graphs. So we have uh, C colors available and the minimum number of colors that is needed to color the graph is key. For example, we can two color cycles or three color grids or 25 color bipartite graph. Now, one way to color this graph of computers is to um, elect a leader, give him all the information about the graph, have the leader compute a solution and then distribute it, communicate it to all parties. This works well if the graph is small. But if we're thinking about a bigger graph, then this means that the, the, the speed of the solution will be bound by the diameter of the, of the graph. So instead, we're gonna try to get an approach where we want to obtain a global coloring, a global solution from only local information. So basically we want to have that every computer in the graph has just some knowledge about its surroundings, its neighborhood, 
true communication and a short range. And so that they can come to a local solution that is also a global solution. So more specifically, the model that we're gonna study is the local model of distributed computing. And, and it works uh, as follow. I'm gonna illustrate it on, on the line now. And so I have four computers. So each node is a computer on a graph and they have unique identifiers, they have unique names. Now the algorithm is gonna proceed in T synchronous round of computation and communication. So the computation is gonna be local and the communication is gonna happen by passing message to your neighbors. So everyone at the same time is gonna send message to all of their neighbors. So there's gonna be computation step, then communication step, then there's gonna be another computation step, another communication step. And then at some point, the nodes will output a solution. What we're interested in is the complexity, which is the minimal number of rounds of computation and communication before um, a solution is reached, a proper solution is reached. In the local model, the, computa the computational power is unbounded locally and the bandwidth so the size of the message that can be communicated is also unbounded. So what I've introduced you is the deterministic model. In the randomized model, in, it's basically the, the same thing, but the players are allowed to um, flip coins to have some private randomness. Now I'm gonna tell you about two other models. One will be the quantum and then the no signaling model. So this is basically the roadmap of the variants that I'm gonna approach today. So what's the quantum model? First, we can consider with or without shared entanglement. Um, our results apply in both cases, so let's just consider that they, they do have shared entanglement. So now the quantum lo local model is gonna be similar to the classical one, but we replace local computation and, lo and communication by quantum computation and quantum communication. So the players are allowed to do some unitaries and then they do some communication, then they do some other unitary, some computation, and then at some point they measure. It might be insightful to view this as a circuit. So here I'm gonna redo it, but with a circuit. So we start with the, with the states of the different nodes. Then they all do this unitary. So since they have access to shared entanglement, we don't lose generality. And so they apply these unitaries, the communication step, computation step, communication step. And then at some point they measure and they output an answer. Now, if you're familiar with circuit complexity, you know that there is a very simple argument we can do in this type of diagrams, which are the light cone arguments. So for example, if we have access to two rounds of computation and communication, well, we will see that the last, we can see that the, say that the last output depends only on what is in this orange light cone. And it doesn't depend on what is outside of it. So we can change the structure of this without affecting the outcome here. And this observation is actually quite powerful and can be generalized. And we're gonna generalize it to define this no signaling local model. So this model is more to be viewed as a tool that allows us to bound um, the quantum model. It's not a model that tells us how to um, how to achieve some computation, but it tells us exactly what we cannot do. And what we cannot do is to violate the no signaling principle. And what, what the no signaling principle is, is that if we take the no signaling algorithm and we put it on two different graphs, 
Well, for any subgraphs of these two graphs that have isomorphic T neighborhood, um, they will, if they have isomorphic T neighborhood, they will have the same output distribution. So to illustrate it, I have two graphs here. And I consider this neighborhood three, the, the subgraph three and two on the top and the bottom. And I'm gonna look at a distance one at the light cone. So the one neighborhood after one step of communication stops here. What this means is that whatever comes afterwards can be changed and it's not gonna affect this probability distribution. So in this case, what three and two outputs must be exactly the same in both scenarios. And we can apply this principle for every every subset, uh, every subgraph of this graph for every graph over which we run the algorithm. Now you might start to, to understand where I'm going. Uh, if not, here's a last int. Imagine you're an int and you are walking on one of these two surfaces. One is a grid and the other is a Klein bottle. And um, how can you tell on which one you are walking? So our results, con one of our results concern grid and it's the easiest one to illustrate. So I'm gonna first tell you about grid and then I will show you how this generalizes to more uh, graph. So let's say that we want to tree color a grid in the deterministic local model. So this cheating graph technique that uses this no signaling principle is actually quite old. That's from the beginning of distributed computing. Um, and, and the argument um, is as follows. So we want to tree color this grid. We know that there's a trivial or a straightforward classical algorithm that can do it in square root of n, where square root of n is the diameter of the grid. And as you can see, there exists a solution to color and a grid. Um, so now we want to, to bound the, the complexity uh, of this uh, algorithm. I mean, of the deterministic local model. So for now, we're gonna forget about this grid. And we're gonna look at this odd quadrangulation. So this is the Klein bottle that I was telling about. So we take the grid, we bend it and, and make a cylinder by gluing the left and right part. Then we twist the bottom and the top, we glue them together and we make this Klein bottle. Now what's interesting about this is that there are some results about odd quadrangulation that allows us to tell that the chronic number of this is at least four, which means that there, if we try to color it with only three color, there is gonna be at least one place where there is no proper coloring. Even if we have full knowledge of the grid or of the Klein bottle. So here the error is here. Now I'm gonna, gonna show that if we have only one round of communication, uh, we're going to make also a mistake. There's going to be also a failure in the grid. So we take this neighborhood, we take this unique identifier, and we have that because of the light cone argument that whenever we have this subgraph neighborhood, the two graphs in the middle are going to make a failure. So namely, we can copy paste this into this scenario, and we will have that the grid will make the same failure as the Klein bottle. Which means that, okay, this grid cannot be colored in one round of communication. Using this argument with more communication and namely bigger grids, uh, we can show that the, the amount of communication that is needed to color the grid is the amount of communication that is needed to tell the difference whether it's a grid or whether it's a Klein bottle. And namely, this is the diameter of it. You need to be able to communicate to, uh, in enough round to be able to, to talk to the person that is on the edge of the grid. And, and only then is the impossibility about the Klein bottle not applying on the grid anymore. 
So this is the argument that tells us, that gives us a lower bound and deterministic local. And what we've done in our work is we've lived this argument from deterministic to no signaling model. Um, so I'll make a first stop at the randomized model, which was deterministic plus private randomness. And the difficulty, the first obstacle that we have here is that in the, with this chromatic number four of the Klein bottle, we could conclude that there was at least one point where there's a failure. But if the Klein bottle is really large, then the probability of failure at a specific point is, is very low. Um, so how do we amplify this? Well, it's, it's simple. We use the independence principle that if subgraph has disjoint T neighborhood, well, they will have independent failure, independent distribution, so independent failure. So each of these nodes will have an uh, independent chance of failing which amplify the result and gives us that, okay, with very high probability, it's not, um, the, the, the grid is not going to be correctly colored. And from this, we obtain the randomized local result, which tells us that the classical algorithm is still optimal. Now I'm gonna skip over the quantum and go directly to the no signaling. So in the no signaling model, we have two new difficulties. One is that because we allow um, a generalization of what is shared entanglement, um, we don't have this independence principle anymore. So we have long range correlation in the grid. And because of the extension of the no cloning theorem, we have uh, that if our cheating construction has n nodes, then our graph will, and that we want to color also needs to have n nodes. So we cannot consider bigger graph. And, but these difficulties can be solved. And we, we, we've developed some kind of systematic techniques that involve covering many copies of the cheating graph and then reassembling them into some disjoint region. Um, I will not give you the details of it, but let's just say that we have a blueprint that allows us to have yeah, a, a systematic argument to build this kind of uh, lower bound. Then we apply it on grids, and we have that this impossibility and this lower bound of, of um, square root of n applies also to the no signaling model. So now we have for grid that the lower bound and the upper bound are exactly the same. So the quantum advantage is, uh, is zero. There's no room for quantum advantage anymore. So this was about grid. Now this blueprint, we can also apply it for general graph. Um, in fact, we, we, we've designed it for general graph because the grids, they also have symmetries that people have used to, to reach um, the similar results. Um, so the, this technique about covering the graph um, need that we need a cheating graph to be able to apply it. So we need a, a graph that has this property where locally it looks like there is a solution, but that globally we know that there's no solution. Um, and it turns out that there's a paper by Bogdanov from roughly 10 years ago that does roughly what we want. Um, and you can see from the title, examples of topologically highly chromatic graph with locally small chromatic number, that it's very relevant. Um, and it turns out that we can apply this technique through a slightly modified version of, of this graph. And we, we obtain that for C coloring key chromatic graph, um, there is a classical algorithm. And so we, we oh, sorry. So we, we obtained this, this lower bound, no signaling, that is n, uh, so the alpha square root, uh, alpha root of n, where alpha is c minus one over um, k minus one, which looks arbitrary, but since it's tight, um, turns out that it's the right answer. And we have a classical algorithm that does it in, um, in the same asymptotic, um, asymptotic, that reads the same asymptotic value up to some polylog factors. 
And then this factor depends whether we are in the randomized algorithm, the classical randomized version or the classical deterministic version. Um, but I haven't told you anything about this classical algorithm, which is the other part of our paper. So now to, to so we have characterized fully the hardness of uh, approximate distributed coloring in general graph. Um, so in particular, if you want to tree color by vertical graph, you have that the complexity is roughly uh, up to polylog factors. It's theta of square root of n. If you want to four color by vertical graph, we have that the complexity is up to polylog factor theta of cubic root of n. And if we want to 25 color, seven colorable graph, well, it's n to the one over four. So now this is solved, but there's still some open problems. One is that we've developed this technique and this blueprint to be able to find um, bound on quantum distributed computing from causality. And our technique doesn't apply only for coloring problems, but for any locally verifiable problem. So locally verifiable problem on graph is a problem for which the solution can be check by looking only at the local neighborhood. So for example, for coloring, um, it's sufficient to check that every pair of nodes have different colors to conclude that it's the right solution. So now we could apply similar technique to other locally verifiable problems and hope that the sandwich is tight. But this is not always the case. And my favorite example is this very uh, simple one where we take an infinite line and we have three colors and we want to color it in finite time. Um, or said in other words, we can try color cycles. And the complexity of this for the classical algorithm is log star n. So log star n um, is uh, smaller than our up to polylog factor, quite small, but it's not constant. However, there is a solution that belongs to the no signaling set that is constant, that is actually two rounds. So now the question is, okay, well, where does quantum fit inside this? And this class of problem that has this complexity log, uh, log star, uh, they're actually quite fundamental in distributed computing. So this is a, an important problem, it's not just an edge case. So to recap, I've introduced the local model of distributed computing. I've talked about the coloring. Um, I've told you that there were four variants uh, that were um, from weakest to strongest in this model. And that the, our argument came from combining fast classical algorithms and no signaling bounds and finding that when they match, there's no quantum advantage. And that these no signaling bounds, they mainly came from adapting this local and distinguishability argument to the no signaling uh, scenario. And from this, we conclude that there, we've characterized the hardness of approximate distributed coloring of two polylog factors. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to take questions. So thank you for your very interesting talk. So any questions from the audience? Hi, thank you for the great talk. Um, I guess a natural question for me was what happens if you bound the amount of communication that happens between each node or parties? Yes, um, if we bound the amount of communication, the other main model of um, distributed computing is called congest, and it does exactly this. Um, and then there's a bit more result in congest than in local concerning quantum advantage, um, mainly because we can do things like Groover's algorithm in, uh, in networks. Okay, so do you think there is a possibility of advantage over there in the congest model for this problem? Yes, I think that there is, uh, there is advantage over there. Oh, okay, thank you. 
Mm, so any any other questions? But I'm not sure it's for coloring. Uh, I didn't study coloring. Okay, I, I have a question myself. So your talk was uh, a bit pessimistic one, so it shows there is no uh, no no signaling advantage, uh, let alone quantum advantage. Where should we look to get quantum advantage in this area? Like which kind of problems we should look at? Yeah, so um, at the moment we're doing exactly this, trying to, to find where we can find quantum advantage. And at the moment, what looks quite promising is to apply an um, idea from network non-locality uh, to, yeah, to, to have some non-local games. And, uh, and from this, we can at least get proof of principle of quantum advantage. What was nice about this work was that it was a very natural problem coloring. And so now what we would really like is quantum advantage for natural problems. And I cannot prophesize yet where it will come. Okay, thank you. So maybe any, any last questions? Okay, if no, then let's thank the speaker again.